everybody i'm recording this screencast for your review this is first of the series of three this screencast is to remind you of the major uh, topics under big idea one and big idea two of ap and this is the first powerpoint on which this uh, screencast is based on however i'm going to be using um, the review notes and stuff but once you're done taking your notes on this, then you should go to this PowerPoint and do the questions, okay? And while you are watching the screencast, you should be filling in the skeleton notes that are in your first packet. So the first topic under states of matter, properties of matter, which are big idea one and two, is law of constant composition and law of multiple proportion. So law of constant composition tells you that the ratio, the mass ratio of elements in a compound is always the same. If it is a pure compound, then the mass ratio of elements will be the same. And remember where we use it? You can use it to justify does this following, are these compounds or not by looking at their mass ratio. Then there is law of multiple proportions, which says if two elements come together to make more than two compounds like NO, N2O, N2O4, and so on, then the mass of one element, you can take either oxygen or nitrogen, that combines with the mass of the other element is always constant, is in, sorry, it's in small whole number ratio. And this is called law of multiple proportions. And these are in your chapter one summary notes. From here, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on mass percent and its implication in pedicle molecular formula. So I am going to now chapter three summary notes. You do have these summary notes with you guys. So if you wanted to, you can refer to these from, your, uh, from the website. So atomic mass unit, molar mass, you know that. Percent composition is what percent of mass comes from a particular element in a whole compound. And as we talk about mass percent, guys, typically you get two types of questions on mass percent. And one type of questions is they will ask you, for example, you have a impure calcium carbonate mixture and when it was treated with an acid, it makes certain moles of CO2. And they will ask you, what is the mass percent of CaCO3 in this mixture? And the assumption here is that the impurity does not react with acid. So the, all the carbon dioxide that's produced is coming from calcium carbonate. So from moles of CO2, you can calculate moles of CaCO3 and then mass of CaCO3 and calculate mass percent. Remember this kind of problem is often asked. So just review those. Then the application we saw in our classroom of mass percent was in two labs, Green Chem Lab and Quick Ache Relief Lab. So in Green Chemistry Lab, what we had is we had a mixture of NaHCO3 and Na2CO3. And these are both white solids. When you heat them up, then NaHCO3 breaks to form CO2, but Na2CO3 does not form any CO2. So CO2 moles, using CO2 moles, we can figure out moles of NaHCO3, and then we can figure out mass percent. So this is how we applied mass percent in green chemistry lab. In quick ache relief lab, remember in this lab, we were given a scenario that there was a manufacturer whose quick ache relief pills were broken and he was trying to figure out why. And one team of scientists was saying that the binder ratios of other team was saying this contamination. So we figured out how much binder and how much acetaminophen and how much ASA, which is the contaminant, if at all present, were present, and then we figured out the mass percent of each. So we applied mass percent and purity, all of these concepts in the two labs we did. Now let's talk about empirical and molecular formulas. And let's scroll down a little bit here. 
and you can see as you go down chapter 3 summary notes we talk about empirical formula empirical formula is smallest mole number uh, mole ratio of different elements in a compound for example C6H12O6 glucose its empirical formula will be CH2O so it shows the simplest whole number ratio of moles empirical formula is very easy to determine but doesn't give off much information so molecular formula um, gives exact number of atoms in a molecule so that's more um, usable but you can easily convert empirical formula to mole molecular formula and we'll see how in a minute now talking a little bit more about empirical formula remember it's the whole smallest number of mole ratios so ultimately you got to calculate number of moles of each element so there are two ways of calculating empirical formula you can do it from percent composition and if the percent composition is given you assume 100 grams of compound so the percents get converted to grams then you figure out moles of each element and then you divide these moles by smallest moles and remember if you don't get the whole ratio then you have to multiply it to get a whole ratio you do not round remember for empirical formula a do not round ever unless it's less than 0.1 or greater than 0.9 and remember in empirical formula if you get a ratio then you got to make sure that it is a whole whole number so do not round it that really is the biggest point here and if your fraction is like a third fraction 0.33 or 0.66 then you multiply by 3 if it is a, a fifth fraction like 0.2 or 0.8 then you multiply it by 5 and so on so that is empirical formula from percent composition you can also calculate empirical formula from combustion data and because most of the compounds have carbon in it and hydrogen in it so combustion works well and the setup for combustion looks like this if you go a little down here so you take your sample of hydrocarbon if it is made up of only carbon and hydrogen as you burn it in oxygen carbon makes carbon dioxide hydrogen makes water and you can pass <clears throat> oxygen over the sample and then we have water absorbing substance in this chamber and by increase in mass of this we can figure out how many grams of water from there we can get grams of hydrogen similarly we can get uh, grams of oxygen and if a substance has carbon hydrogen and oxygen remember to get oxygen grams you take total mass and subtract carbon and hydrogen grams from it you cannot use mole ratio because some of the oxygen is present inside the compound and some is coming from outside so the only way to figure out oxygen is to subtract from total the mass of carbon and hydrogen now how do you convert empirical formula to molecular formula to do that you take empirical formula mass so let me take example of glucose again you come up with empirical formula of glucose at CH2O you take its mass and it comes out to be 12 plus 2 14 30 grams per mole and they will have to give you molar mass they will say molar mass of this substance is 180 grams per mole and when you divide 180 by 30 you know the coefficient is 6 so then you multiply the whole formula by 6 and C6H12O6 comes out to be molecular formula next thing I'm going to go a little fast otherwise the podcast will get very very long I have lots of concepts to cover the next thing that I'm going to talk about is stoichiometry and remember limiting reactant guys anytime you are given grams or moles of both the reactants you must first determine which is the limiting reactant and limiting reactant is important because that's what determines how much product will you form and you've done many of those problems so remember to practice some limiting reactant problems along with that some percent yield and don't confuse it with percent error because percent error is different 
The last thing that I want to discuss here is how do you determine formula of hydrate? And we have done this in class again. This was a PBA. You first make the mass of crucible constant. You burn off impurities. Then you take some substance in there. You weigh how much hydrated compound you have. You heat it up strongly to drive off the water. Get mass of water lost. Get moles of water. And then figure out the ratio. Now here is the problem. In hydrates, you round. So you do not use a multiplier for hydrates, but you use a multiplier for empirical formula. Remember that elements. Okay, so we are done with this one. Now I am going to talk about mass spectroscopy and um, isotopes. And that is in chapter 2. I opened all of these, so give me one minute. So chapter two notes, let's see, these are one, three, here, right here. Okay, so isotopes, as you know, are the elements of, they are the atoms of the same element that have same atomic number, but different mass number, because they have different number of neutrons. So mass spectroscopy is a technique through which we can separate different mass fragments. So you can read about the technique by going on the website, we had gone over it. But what comes out of that technique is what is called a mass spectrograph. In mass spectrograph, on the x-axis is the mass, and the y-axis shows either relative or percent abundance. And every mass fragment shows up at a different place because it weighs different. And if you see all the percents don't add up to 100, then this is relative abundance, not percent abundance, and then you change it with the highest one out of 100%, okay? So here you can, what all you can do from a mass spectroscopy data, you can calculate average atomic mass. And remember the formula for average atomic mass is percent abundance times decimal fraction of atomic mass for the first isotope decimal fraction of percent abundance times, I'm just going too fast and losing my words, I need to slow down, plus times atomic mass of that fragment of that isotope plus percent abundance of decimal, fra decimal fraction of percent abundance of isotope 2 times the mass of that isotope and so on. So using mass spectroscopy, you can calculate average atomic mass you can tell which is the most abundant isotope by looking at the peak. Um, you can also use this as a diagnostic tool to see if a certain substance is present in your sample. So it will give a certain peak. So if that peak is present, then you know that substance is present. We sometimes can use that for figuring out if there is contamination of something or other. From here, I'm going to take you to chapter 6 summary notes and go to electron configurations. Chapter 6 summary notes, right here. And chapter 6 summary notes, so guys, this one is about electron configuration and um, uh, C is lambda nu, so the only formula you still need to know C is lambda nu, where C is speed of light, lambda is wavelength, nu is frequency, wavelength units are nanometers or me meters, frequency is 1 over second or hertz. And you also need to know the other formula, which, which is E is equal to H nu or HC over lambda. And from here, I'm going to go directly to electron configuration. And electron configurations, guys, you know how to write electron configuration by looking at periodic table. Couple things about electron configurations. So as we talk electron configuration, in electron configuration, you should be able to tell the ion configuration. One thing I will remind you, if we look at copper, which is, remember, it's an exception. It's S1, D, where is copper? It's not periodic table. Um, S1, D10, right. So if we are talking copper 1 plus ion, it'll be S0, D10. 
copper 2 plus ion will be S0 D9. So the S electron is lost first before the D electron in ion formation. The second thing I want you to remember is what produces colors in an ion. And the colors are produced when you have partly filled d orbital. As electrons jump up and down, they uh, absorb energy and jump to these empty d orbitals. And when they come down to the ground, they give off colors. So partly filled d sublevel. Partly means not 5, not 10, but any, any other number. Then the next thing here is excited versus ground state. Ground state electron configuration is as you read it off the periodic table. Excited is when you have the same number of electrons as an atom, but they are not in a pause arrangement. So instead of 1s2, 2s2, it could be 1s2, 2s1, and so on. And the last thing I want to talk about here is how, what is PES of photo emission spectroscopy and how can it help us identify or how does it give us evidence of electron configuration? And lastly, how can we use ionization energy to tell us about electron configuration? So let's scroll down here. PES of photo emission spectroscopy, what that has, this is my spectroscopy here again. Photo emission spectroscopy here, I'm going to zoom it a little bit, right here. So in photo emission spectroscopy, we can knock off any electron selectively, not only the outermost, but any electron. And we can figure out how much energy was required to knock off that electron. So on x-axis is energy in a PES, and on y-axis is number of electrons. So if a peak is three times as much as other peaks, so if these are two electrons, then this will be six electrons. So the height of peak tells you number of electrons. And then remember, the inner electrons will require more energy than outer electrons. So really, the, if the energy is increasing here, the, the first 1s electrons will be the highest energy. These will be these ones because they require most energy because of greatest effective nuclear charge. So that is photo emission spectroscopy. And it provides a proof that indeed both the s electrons have the same energy and that 2s electrons have lower energy than 1s electron and 3s have even lower. From here, we're going to go to periodic trends and periodic trends chapter there. Right, right here. Chapter seven, periodic trends, and you can go over each of these guys. Um, there are there's ionization energy, there's electron affinity, there's electronegativity, and then there is uh, metallic character, and you need to know the keywords. And remember, effective nuclear charge doesn't work for all. Effective nuclear charge is the keyword to use if you are talking about atomic radius or ionization energy or ionic radius. When you're talking about uh, increase in atomic size down the group, so this is for across the period. And my recommendation is actually calculate effective nuclear charge before you say that that's the character. So going down a group increase in atomic size is attributed to higher electron-electron repulsion. And according to Coulomb's law, if the repulsion is more, they'll be farther apart and the size increases. And ionization energy trend is opposite of that of atomic radius. The larger the radius, the lower the ionization energy. And if you are given ionization energy data and there is a sudden increase, like if they say for an atom, atom A, and the first ionization energy is 100, second is 200, and third is 1800. Suddenly there's a jump. 
then you can say that now to remove this it takes significantly more energy so this must be it this must be the inner electron so it has two valence electron and now this one is its inner electron so you can say this atom will form two plus cation because it has two valence electrons because the first two can be removed with lower energy and third one is higher so ionization energy can help us figure out electron configuration as well okay then you will need to go through the keywords uh, document that I had but I'm not going to uh, go over much remember metallic character is ability or ease of losing electrons so as you go down a group because atomic radius increases then more metallic character and as you go from left to right in periodic table because atomic size decreases non-metallic character increases so the strongest metals are bottom left of the periodic table strongest non-metals are top right of the periodic table electronegativity again increases as you go from left to right across a pe uh, period and it decreases going down a group because of Coulomb's law and increase in size okay Remember your exceptions for ionization energy and electron affinity. One other thing before I go to exception, electron affinity guys, it's actually the amount of energy released when an electron is added to a gaseous atom in its ground state. Whatever amount of energy is released is called electron affinity. And the negative sign here just means release of energy. So negative 200 is higher electron affinity as compared to negative 100 because that's release in energy so negative sign it's not a negative number negative is a sign indicating the direction of energy transfer so it's release of energy so this is higher electron affinity and electron affinity increases across the period and decreases down the group and exceptions now so Typically, ionization energy decreases across a period except after the second group. Between the 13th group, there is a slight dip because in the 13th group, you are removing electron from the P versus the S sublevel. Then there is a slight decrease in group 13, 14, 15, 16. Between 15 and 16, that's because now in group till group 15 you were filling one electron in each p but in 16 you had a paired electron so when you remove the paired electron due to electron electron repulsion this is lost easier so also here i think the reason i'm sorry from s and p the don't forget to mention that yes you're removing it from s versus p but then what the reason is p electrons because they move in a dumbbell they do not penetrate the nuclear region the same way the s electrons penetrate that region and that's where i'm going to end the periodic trends but i have lots to go so uh, next thing i want to go over is titration and titration chapter four summary notes so Reactions is a smaller topic and I will be dealing with it separately so I'm not going to address it here but I'm going to go over titration. Titration is where the moles of H plus becomes equal to moles of OH minus. Remember we often call it M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2 but really what we are doing here is moles of H plus are equal to moles of OH minus. Know these terms like titrant and um, standard solution and so on. Remember, as you titrating, the unknown typically is in the Erlenmeyer flask. You put the standard solution through here. Remember to prepare your burette. You must rinse with DI water first. Then you rinse with the solution that you intend to fill it with. Because if you don't, you'll dilute the solution and then the molarity of the unknown acid will come out to be higher than you expect it to be. And um, one other thing to remember in titration 
is no matter how carefully you make NaOH solution, because NaOH is a hygroscopic material, what happens in NaOH is even though you make it very carefully, but as you're weighing it out on the balance, it absorbs water and you can never weigh it out properly. So it's a good idea to standardize your standard NaOH solution. So yes, you have made NaOH solution very carefully and you think it's around 0.1 molarity or whatever molarity you made, but it will not be exactly that molarity. So then you titrate it against a solid acid like a KHP or another acid to find what is the actual molarity of this NaOH. Is it 0.1 or 0 0.09? or 0.11, right? So when you use a solid acid, the idea is to standardize your standard NaOH because it absorbs water as you're making the solution. Now I'm going to take you, talk about acid strength a little bit. And remember, you can determine the strength of acid by the ease of losing the proton. The easier it loses the proton, the stronger the acid is. So between HCl and HClO, if there are two electronegative atoms pulling the electron density of the shared pair to the side, this proton will be more positively charged and will be lost easier. So this will be a stronger acid as compared to this. On to the gases now. Here. So gases, guys. There is a whole lot in this chapter. Remember a few things. First and foremost, anytime you have um, URMS equation or anywhere where there's energy involved in this chapter, you put mass and molar mass in kilograms. There's no place else in chemistry that you do it, so remember that. KMT gives us a theoretical model for behavior of gases. And it says that most of the space between gas particles is empty. There's literally no attraction between them and they can expand and so on. I'm not going to go into details. You can watch the podcast again um, if you need further clarity, but I'm highlighting a few things here. Remember ideal gas equation, Pavnert. So the big question is ideal or non-ideal. There are only two type of stoichiometry problem you'll get here. So ideal gas equation is under um, anything but STP. And if it is a STP situation, then you use the relationship one mole of gas will occupy 22.4 liters volume. Remember, standard temperature and pressure is 0 degrees Celsius and 1 atm. And RTP, room temperature and pressure, is 25 degrees Celsius and 1 atm. So a lot of the problems are based on these two formulas here. Now... We go down, these are the relationships. No, you don't need to memorize this as well as this is Charles. As long as you know ideal gas law, it's good enough. Dalton's law of partial pressure tells you that the individual moles of gases add up to get the overall moles. Sometimes This is applied and asked in a lot of ways, guys. So sometimes they'll give you this gas had this much volume, this much volume, and so on. Remember, volume and pressure or volume and number of moles Volume and pressure are inversely proportional, but volume and number of moles are directly proportional because the more moles, more um, collisions, and the gas expands uh, because the particles are moving all over. Okay. Also, when we collect gas over water, then we, we use Dalton's law of partial pressure. We must remember to subtract the vapor pressure of water, which will be given to you in the stoichiometry problems. Graham's law of effusion says that rates of effusion of two gases are, square, are, are equal to square root of inverse of their molar masses and equal to T2 over T1, okay, the time taken to diffuse. Then there is average speed or URMS speed that's equal to square root of 3RT over M. This is where M is in kilograms, remember that. Then deviation from ideal behavior are most at low temperature and high pressure because then gas particles are close by. So to accommodate real behavior of gases, because not all gases behave ideal, we have another equation, Van der Waals equation, which has two constants, A and B, to 
account for non zero to account for lower pressure of real gases so you add a little factor to the real gas pressure to make it look more like ideal gas and you take away little from the volume to accommodate for non-zero volume of the real gases. You do not need to memorize this equation. It's there on your equation sheet. Just know that A and B are constant that vary with the type of gas they will be given to you. You just need to understand the theoretical model behind it and need to be able to plug and chug it. And this was from another resource. You can see it's not from my notes. Next thing we're going to go over is IMFs. This podcast is already getting very long. You guys might want to take a break, stop it, um, and keep filling your skeleton notes, even though I'm going fast. Um, it will be nice if you went back to these summary notes and your review packets and in addition to what you heard from me, you also filled in the notes thoughtfully. So chapter 11, which is intermolecular forces, guys, there are, so intermolecular forces are weak, but they are important because they determine very many physical properties such as solubility, state of matter, and um, uh, colligative properties, right? So solubility will depend like dissolves like. So if the intermolecular bonds of the solvent and solute both are similar, then they dissolve into each other. Also, the stronger the intermolecular force, the solid, the phase is determined by that. So the substance will be the solid with stronger intermolecular force and so on. And these are the different type of IMFs, ion ion, ion dipole, dipole dipole, hydrogen and LDFs. I would like to clarify hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond happens when hydrogen is bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and if there is another ammonia on the other side, then definitely this is hydrogen bond. But even if there's a highly electronegative atom here that can attract the hydrogen here, that will still be hydrogen bond. So hydrogen bond is the intermolecular bond that's formed when hydrogen is intramolecularly bonded to N, O, or F. So there needs to be an intramolecular or covalent bond between hydrogen and N, O, or F. And then the intermolecular bond that happens is called hydrogen bond. And the strength, pretty much it is given in the decreasing strength. So you can see it there. And then bonding, and I'm going to address very little of bonding because I feel you have a good grasp on this, but let me do a quick review of bonding. So types of bonding are ionic, covalent, metallic, and the strength of ionic bonding is given by lattice energy, which is defined as amount of energy to require or released when one mole of ions come together to form one mole of an ionic compound. And this is given by Coulomb's law, where R plus and R minus are the cation and anion radii. And these are the charges. Metallic bond strength is given by, uh, by the electrostatic attraction between the positively charged cations, atom cations, and the negatively charged electrons in the matrix. Remember, metals are malleable and ductile, ductile uh, and malleable because of delocalized electrons. So you can stretch them into wire, you can hammer them into sheet without breaking the bonds because as you stretch them, there are some or the other electrons present to attract the nuclei. Then there is ionic bond and you know it's between a metal and a non-metal covalent. Sorry, I went over ionic. Covalent bond is between two nonmetals, and if the electrons are shared evenly, then it is nonpolar covalent, otherwise, it's polar covalent and coordinate covalent. And coordinate covalent is not in our curriculum. Then we go to resonance structures. Remember, resonance structures are when you can draw more than one uh, Lewis structures for a substance which has same formal charge. Formal charge review. Remember, formal charge is 
the number of valence electron on one atom in on the periodic table minus how many electrons are assigned to that atom in the structure. For example, nitrogen on periodic table has five valence electron. In this structure, it has two lone pairs. So one lone pair, two electrons, one, two, and half of the bonded pair. So three, four, five. So five minus five, zero. Carbon will be four minus uh, four, zero again. And oxygen will be six minus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, minus one. So go over formal charges again. Formal charges help us determine the best Lewis structure. If more than one Lewis structure shows the same formal charge, then you know it's resonance structure. So first you're looking for formal charge closest to zero. Absolute value of form, formal charge closest to zero on most atoms. If all atoms have the same formal charge, then the more negative formal charge should be on more electronegative atom. And that qualifies for your best Lewis structure. Then there are VSEPR shapes, and you should know the shapes and memorize them. And a little bit about alloys. And alloys are metal solutions and there are substitutional alloys and then there are um, just a second let me zoom it out yeah there is interstitial and substitutional alloys substitutional alloys the two metal atom sizes should be about the same because one substitutes the other in interstitial alloys one of the metal atoms that you're substituting with or putting in the other one should be considerably smaller to go and sit in the in-between spaces. In substitutional alloys, because you've substituted, it's still flexible and soft and not that hard, but interstitial alloys are harder than the substitutional alloys. And last part of this is going to be on review one, which is more like chromatography. Is it review one? No, this is chapter four. This is alloys. Six, two, one, three. So many notes. Oh, oh, I don't have review one. Let me just pull it up. Let me go to units page and review one. I would like to go over some of the lab techniques that we had done here like measuring. How do you read the measurements? Guys, remember all graduated or all graduations plus the first guess number makes significant digit. So all graduated numbers plus first guess number. Then beaker goes to no place of decimal plus minus five mils. Graduated cylinder goes to one place of decimal, okay? And burette and pipette can reach to two places of decimals. So that's a general guideline. Remember it. Now, as you go down, this is chromatography. Remember, chromatography separates a mixture of ink by putting either a paper or a stationary phase in a mobile phase. And as mobile phase climbs up, it takes the more soluble stuff with it, the one that is in mobile phase, more soluble in mobile phase. Typically, your mobile phase is water, but it doesn't have to be water. It could even be a nonpolar solvent. So you have to see carefully which is your mobile phase, polar or nonpolar. And if your mobile phase is polar and something is moving with the mobile phase, then this substance must be polar and nonpolar will get left behind and that's how your spots are separated. So that's chromatography and there's gel chromatography that uses the same principle. You can calculate the RF value, which is the distance that the stop, the spot travels to the initial. So here you take the center of this spot, measure this distance, and you see what is the solvent front, meaning how far has the solvent gone. So if you take the distance the spot has traveled and divided by solvent front, you get a value called RF, it's a decimal value. And RF is like an identification characteristic for uh, ink. So 
that is there. Now, next thing that we're going to go over is particulate level drawings are big, guys, for titration, for everything. So please go through these again. You understand um, how to write them, how to make them, how to read the burette. The difference between the volumetric pipette versus graduated pipette. Some of you were asking in a question from AP, this is a volumetric pipette. It can only deliver a certain amount. Unlike a graduated pipette where you can put like one mils or two mils, with a volumetric pipette, you can only deliver the given amount. And let's go down here. And there is also distillation. I don't have the technique here. But distillation is you first boil off a mixture. The lower boiling substance boils off first, and then the higher boiling substance boils off later. And remember, while something is boiling, its temperature doesn't change. So if you put a thermometer in there, you can see when the first component starts boiling, you boil it off, and then remove your receiving flask, then put a new flask, and get your second uh, component there. I will be back with CV Lab in the next podcast and I will be back with number two screencast.